ladies and gentlemen, Rex Bear Leak Project, a 5.8 magnitude earthquake just hit outside of Yellowstone, 48 kilometers from the Helena Valley, west central Montana, United States. Now you can see right here, I got two emails this morning from people that live out there. One of them said, actually one person lives out there, I don't know where the other person lives, I think Arizona. Um, but the one person that lives out there said, Rex, the earthquake was the worst I ever felt. I was dizzy. What's going on? The clouds are bizarre out here. They're rolling in black. There's this weird red and yellow coloring out in the sun, um, in the horizon, I should say. Not in the sun, but out in the horizon. What is going on? Well, let's hope that this 5.8 earthquake is actually a good thing out there. Let's hope that all these earthquakes, because I did some um, checking. I went and pulled this up right here. The past 30 days... There's been 1,174 earthquakes in the region. Now, normally this time of year, the earthquake does um, earthquake activity does spike. It does increase, but not this much. The yearly average of earthquakes for an entire year, including this month, ladies and gentlemen, because I've had several people say, this is normal, Rex, totally normal. The yearly average for earthquakes in Yellowstone is 2,000. They say 1 to 3,000 is the yearly average. So let's average that out. 2,000 is the yearly average. We've hit over 1,100 quakes in 30 days. Take 1174 times that by 12, you've got over 14,000 earthquakes. That's a 700% increase if you use the 2,000 earthquakes a year scenario. Now, with that said, maybe all of these mini quakes, it's allowing it to vent, to cool off, so it doesn't go boom. Now, when you do have people saying that they've lived out there their whole lives and a 5.8 quake is the is the most intense they've ever felt, well, that de definitely makes me more, it would make me more aware and more prepared for a situation in that area to get the heck out of Dodge if I needed to. If I start seeing animals leave Yellowstone, that's when I know it's time to go. Because animals seem to be in that psychic no, into that whatever that vibrational frequency is that they can tap into. Keep an eye on the animals. Now, Lincoln, Montana, power was actually lost out there because the earthquake was so intense. And elevation out there, it's about 4,500 feet, about 1,100 people. And it's not a very big area. And that size of an earthquake is quite the anomaly. Now... I pulled up the map right here just so you can see for yourself that you're only, and that's if you're taking all these turns and stuff like that, you're less than 250 miles. If you were to take a straight path there, it's less than 250 miles away. Uh, we'll go back over here and look at all the activity in the area. 1,174 earthquakes in the past 30 days. Let's take a look at this right here. So you can see you've got the interactive map, the regional information. If you go to usgs.gov, the earthquake.usgs.gov, the shake map. This is a pretty neat website right here. So the July 6th, 5.8 quake, according to this website, occurred as the result of shallow strike slip faulting along either a right lateral near vertical fault trending east-southeast or on a left lateral vertical fault striking north, northwest, northeast, I'm sorry. Nanu, nanu. The location and focal mechanism solution of this earthquake are consistent with right lateral faulting in association with faults of the Lewis and Clark line, a prominent zone of strike slip, dip slip, and oblique slip faulting trending east, southeast from northern Idaho to east of Helena, Montana, southeast of this earthquake. It's a broad zone of faulting, about 400 kilometers in length, up to 80 kilometers wide. <laughs> wow. Quite incredible. So there you have it, a 5.8 quake in Yellowstone. You guys should pick up one of these quick bivvies. Click the link in my video description box. Everybody should seriously have one of these quick bivvies. They fit in the palm of your hand. They weigh a few ounces. You can put them just about anywhere. Glove box, under your car seat. You can put them in your bug out bag. In, if you're a gal and you've got a small purse, you could put one of these in your purse. And if you ever get in a situation where you need to stay warm and you didn't come prepared, this three ounce 
bag, bivy sack, could help save your life. And they're cheap. So click the link. Be excellent to each other. Be the change you want to see. Leakproject.com. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me this edition of Leak Project. There is 121 quadrillion gallons of lava underneath Yellowstone. Now, I'm going to share with you multiple news articles and white papers and documents and models that show different variables. One thing for certain is that's a lot of freaking magma. I mean, that is a lot of lava. 121 quadrillion gallons of lava, or approximately 11,000 cubit miles. That's a lot. So let's go ahead and look at these papers now. I appreciate all of you that have joined me this edition, and thank you, moderators, for taking care of the chat room. It's always nice to have a live audience. I actually just talked to my brother in Alaska, and it was I haven't talked to him in like two years. He moved out to Alaska, and he's doing great. He said, Rex, I've been listening to your live shows. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. So it's just it's really cool that you guys are here with me. It wouldn't be nearly as much fun without you. And I'd like to share with you this information right now. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video. Uh, it's kind of hot in here. I'm going to turn off the fan, too. It's, it's a little bit over 100 degrees in my garage right now. So if you see me sweating a little bit, that's why. Uh, I haven't got air conditioning yet, nor do I think I want air conditioning. It's kind of nice to have the heat. But let's go. Nanny, nanny, nanny. What you are looking at right here, this first document is from you. K Express. You can go to express.co.uk. Yellowstone time bomb over 11,000 miles of magma just waiting to spew from the park. So more than 11,000 cubic miles of magma is waiting to burst from beneath the world's most dangerous volcano in Yellowstone National Park in the U.S. Now this article is from John Austin and so now I want to share with you the actual data. So it's, it's always good to read an article, and then I'll read an article that will come out in the mainstream or alternative forums, and I'll connect the dots with science and other data, white papers, graphs, charts, etc. I converted 11,000 cubic miles to 37,171,120,000, or I'm sorry, 37,171,200,000 acres. That's how many acres of magma are underneath Yellowstone. O over 37 billion acres. <laughs> nice. So you can see right here, they say Yellowstone is considered the most dangerous volcano. Although I don't know if I agree with that. There's even larger volcanoes. Now, if you look at what's gone on over the past, let's say, million years, couple million years, about 640,000 years ago, Yellowstone erupted with 1,000 cubic kilometers. Toba, 74,000 years ago, had 2,800 cubic kilometer explosion. Now, if we take that and compare it to Mount Rainier, I used to live out close to Mount Rainier. Used to go biking out there all the time, loved it. Well, approximately 250 B.C., 0.3 cubic kilometers was released. St. Helens in 1980, 0.25. Then you can get to Crater Lake 7,600 years ago. Crater Lake is gorgeous, absolutely beautiful, about 150 cubic kilometers. Well, now Yellowstone is even more built up than before. So if we go here and look at another model, I think this is a pretty good chart to take a look at. You can see that the, you know, about 2 million years ago, you had 600 cubic miles. Then you go 630,000 years ago, 240. Island Park, Mount Mazama. You can look at something that, you know, in 1883, 1991, 1980, 0.24 cubic miles. And I talked to people that had ash fall on the East Coast. On the East Coast from Mount St. Helens. So think about that. 0.24 cubic miles people were filling it on the East Coast. Now there's 11,000. That doesn't mean it's all going to be released at once. And I really doubt it would be. 
the potential is definitely incredible. Now, these are directly from government. These are government white papers, folks. These show previous ashfall. You can see almost the entire United States was exposed to this ash from a two million year old Yellowstone eruption. You can see Yellowstone, uh, Mount St. Helen. You can see the proportion there to kind of connect the dots. And then if we go here, natural hazard science dot Oxford, this is directly from Oxford University. Let's look at figure four here. Well, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about what it says in the paper. One of the youngest and largest caldera complexes in the United States covers most of Yellowstone National Park. The three caldera forming eruptions there occurred 2 million, 1.3 million, and 600,000 years ago. That collectively dumped volcanic ash over most of the central and western U.S. Magmas beneath the national park continue to be observed remotely. These bodies supply the heat for many thermal features, such as Old Faithful. Now, that brings me to the next point that I want to make with you guys. Instead of fracking the planet for fuel, instead of nuclear reactors, even solar panels sometimes, and windmills, why not have a thermal system energy grid to where you could actually use the energy from the heat of this lava, this magma, and that might even be able to offset some of these volcanoes. And in a moment, I'm going to link the chemtrail dumps with volcanoes and the possible um, triggered volcanoes to cause certain effects. What I was talking to you about in the last program, I've got documents to share with you there directly from the belly of one of the beasts. I mean, you can see clearly right here the amount of ash fall from previous eruptions. Here's another one here. You can see what happened in Italy, Greece, Turkey, China, India, Asia, Pacific, as well as the U.S. Now, I don't know how valid this map is. This is from a website that I will leave a link in the video description box for you. You can see the ashfall map shows a 60-mile hazard zone. Temperatures are going to reach supposedly 150 Fahrenheit in 60 minutes. The 500-mile evacuation zone, day three, ashfall reaches three feet. A 1,000 miles affected zone, day seven, turns sky dark. Will it get that intense? Well, let's hope not. Certainly hope not. Now, these are the papers directly from USGS where they use computer modeling to predict how much ash fall. And it's not nearly as bad with some of these calculations as it is with the one that I shared with you earlier, showing 10 feet of ash in some places, far away from the explosion. Another thing that I feel that the powers that be could do is they could manipulate the jet stream, they could manipulate the wind during an event like this to cause certain parts of the world to get exposed to more ash fall than others. This is directly from geodynamics of the Yellowstone hotspot and mantle plume, seismic and GPS imaging. This is available at Science Direct. You can purchase the entire PDF or you can just read the abstract. And I'm going to go down here and read a little bit to you. Locally, episodes of subsidence and uplift averaging two centimeters a year characterize the 80-year Yellowstone caldera monitored history and are modeled as hydrothermal magmatic sources. Moreover, a recent episode from 2004 to 2009 of accelerated uplift, this is what's interesting right here, from 2004 to 2009, accelerated uplift of the Yellowstone caldera at rates up to seven centimeters a year. So that is a 350% increase of five years. Now, these models are resulting from magmatic, magmatic recharge of a 10-kilometer deep sill at the top of the crustal magma reservoir. Read all about it. This is from the same source. 
You can see 650 kilometer plume. You can see the different areas. The just gives you kind of a, an idea on what you can look forward to from 16 million years ago to present 660 kilometers to the surface. The Yellowstone hotspot volcanism. All the links are going to be in the video description box. And here you go. There was an article that came out, scienceabc.com, and it was, what happens if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere? What happens if the Earth didn't have an atmosphere? You can see the exosphere, that's where they have the satellites. You can see that's about 1,000 kilometers up. That's 25% of the overall atmosphere. Then you have the thermosphere, which is about 80 kilometers. You're going to see the northern lights there. Then about 50 kilometers, you've got the mesosphere, then the stratosphere, then the troposphere. See the ozone in there. What happened if all that was gone? Well, read all about it. Scienceabc.com. This is where I'm going to connect the terraforming, the stratospheric aerosol injections to cool the planet. I've got absolute proof right here. Swamp gas from Uranus. This is all just a conspiracy. Stratospheric aerosol, lifetime, let's say one to three years. You can see spraying the atmosphere there. What does that do? Well, that is going to literally change the planet. That will terraform the planet. It increases planetary albedo. And I'm going to get to what that is in a minute if you don't know. It's, it's pretty intense. Increasing planetary albedo by literally artificially manipulating the planet. So not only... Are they doing this to cool the Earth? It's terraforming the planet. Look at this. Tropospheric aerosols, lifetime, one to three weeks. That's down here where the clouds are at. It says it right there. Cirrus modification. Then you go above that into the stratosphere, and they've got injections in there that are lasting one to three years. Think about that for a minute, folks. They're spraying stuff into the atmosphere that's lasting three years. Now, what is an albedo? It's a measure for reflectance of optical brightness. What does it do? Well, it's an important concept in climatology, astronomy, and environmental management. Environmental management. The Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Program for Sustainable Rating of Buildings. The average albedo of the Earth at the top of the atmosphere is planetary albedo. It's 30 to 35 percent because of cloud cover, but widely varies across the surface because of different geological and environmental features. They are raising the radiation. They are terraforming the planet and increasing planetary albedo. I have been discussing with you guys for the past four years how I think that the reason the average levels of radiation are increasing is because of these injections. Because it is not only terraforming the planet, it's allowing more light to come in. Or if it's blocking the light to come in, the light that does come in bounces back and forth off of this fake shield, this ridiculous shield. And it's increasing the radiation. It's increasing the planetary albedo. And eventually they feel that's going to change the weather to where it's going to cool the planet down. They think that by doing this, it's going to cool the planet down. You can see right here, these are active volcanoes. There's a lot of them here in the U.S. alone, just on the West Coast. Volcanic hazards based on activity in the last 15,000 years. You can see you've got a lot here on the coast, on the West Coast, and then obviously Yellowstone. So what does it all mean? Does it mean that we need to be worried? No, absolutely not. It means that being aware and being prepared is probably the most effective form of action. Now, let's hope that there's very intelligent people out there that are working on programs to offset possible cataclysms like this. Maybe all these earthquakes that we're seeing is a good thing. Maybe they're doing something to offset a huge cataclysm, a huge catastrophe. It's just amazing to look at how much magma, how much lava is actually down there. You know, once again, this is from 640,000 years ago. There was 1,000 cubic kilometers. 
Now there's about 11,000. Well, that was the explosion. I'm sure there was more than that down there at the time, but that was the explosion. Now we're looking at 11,000 cubic miles underneath around Yellowstone. It completely dwarfs New Mexico, where I just got back from that area that showed the tw where there was 29 different volcanoes in about 4,000 acres. And for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles getting there, you could see this lava rock, which was slowly being pushed up to the surface. It's incredible. So why don't the powers that be, instead of fracking the planet, instead of nuclear reactors, instead of all these fossil fuels to power stuff, why don't they use the energy from the lava from our own planet and help offset some of these volcanoes by using that energy, by supplying energy to the people? Well, if they did that, then the petroleum industry would most likely disappear or it would completely shrink. The nuclear industry, except for military purposes, would be completely obsolete and stupid. And virtually all other form of energy, unless, I mean, you could create a whole energy network around the entire planet by just harnessing the Earth's natural energy from this lava and magma. How cool would that be? So maybe if enough people put their heads together and if enough people can be the change, maybe something like that would take place on a global scale. You know, if you didn't have to be reliant on energy, imagine what you could do. Imagine the possibilities if people didn't have to be reliant on spending X percent of their income every month to provide energy to get them from point A to point B, to get them from point A to point B comfortably. Think of all the industries that would collapse and crumble and be just completely obsolete. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that maybe Tesla was grasping into. I don't know. I was, I was doing some serious meditation in New Mexico, and I thought to myself, if I could do one thing that would make the most impact, that would benefit the planet, what would that be? What would that be? And I thought to myself, what's something that is abundant and infinite and you could use for multiple applications? Like you could use it for storage. You could use it for fuel. You could, you know, for energy. You could use it for not only software, but hardware. You could use it as different mediums. What would be one object or one source that you could do that with? How could you take light? How could you take light from the sun and from the stars and convert that into not only energy, which can be done, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to convert the sunlight into chemical fuels. I've shared that with you guys. That's one of the reasons they're beta testing trimethyl aluminum into the atmosphere is they feel that's going to increase their optoelectronics there as a, and many other applications where they can literally harness the sun, turn that into a chemical fuel What's something that could be used to hold information, to relay information, to produce energy, to produce light, light, course, frequency? John Hutchinson, I need to get him on the show. That guy is brilliant. You guys heard of the Hutchinson effect where he takes frequency and sound and he'll, he'll project it towards blocks of steel and they'll twist like they're pieces of a Tootsie Roll? of a candy bar like you're just twisting the top off. And then he's also sprayed it in area. Um, he's also projected it in areas where there was lots of pollution in the water and it just completely dissipated. It's frequency. Frequency is the wave of the future. Harnessing frequency, harnessing light, tapping into that energy source combined with the lava, the Earth's natural resources, using those technologies in combination with our own minds. That's what's going to solve things. And for people out there that leave the nasty comments, I don't even have time for you anymore. I'm, I'm beyond that. Now, might I, di you know, might I divagate in the future and start going, you know, getting a little bit upset by some of the trolls? Sure, it might happen. But it's to the point now where you read 99% of the comments that the trolls leave anyway, and they don't have anything except for nastiness. And you can tell by the words that they write, they're projecting their own thoughts onto you to make themselves feel better about themselves. Stuff like this, if we find a solution, that's what's key. Finding a solution to the problem. Well, what's the solution? I think I just came up with a pretty darn good 
answer right there. Find something, get the most brilliant minds together, and then once they come up with that, once they come up with that idea, then you get it onto the market. Do not give those behind the scenes that control many of the powers that be enough time to stop it from hitting the market. Just immediately, boom. If this reaches, let's say, 100,000 people over the next few weeks, this specific podcast, and people start thinking that in their mind, what could they do? What could they create? What, what could they invent? What could they formulate to take light literally from the stars and convert it to not only energy but other forms of frequency where you could use it for healing modalities. You could use it not only to heal people but to heal the earth to create organic to create an organic source again because if we let this artificial construct continue to take over, what do I mean by artificial construct? Fluoride in the water, genetically modified foods that have pesticides that grow within the corn without even having to spray pesticides. Then you eat that, then it's like putting pesticides directly in your gut. That is not organic. That is artificial. Creating artificial constructs that suck the life energy, the organic life energy, and convert it into artificial forms of energy. Look all around you. Even funerals. Even when you're buried. You want to be filled with formaldehyde and then put in a coffin and then buried in the ground so that your physical body can slowly decay over millions of years? Do you think that you think there's no connection to the spirit world once you leave it? I think that the the Nordics, the you know, Valhalla, the Vikings, at least as far as their way of going, after they pass being put on a boat and then lit on fire so that their, their spirit can go to the heavens reminds me of that Sumerian tablet where Enkidu was asked about what happened when he saw these people that died and the way that they died and, and what they did before they died. And then there was a passage about what happens to the people that are burnt. He said he didn't see them in the netherworld because their spirit went up into the heavens. Think about that for a minute. I mean, the whole construct of our reality, this entire matrix that we're in, just seems to be manipulated. It seems to be just a completely artificial construct that is feeding the alternative of pure life, of divine source. It's the opposite. It's the nemesis. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash clandestine time lord. Also, leakproject.com. We have exclusive content. If you go to leakproject.com, there is a premium members section there. Check out getthetea.com if you're looking for some extremely good, affordable, quality health care type products, stuff that's good for your immune system, immune system boosters stuff that helps your digestive tract work better, detox products, etc. check out getthetea.com. It's amazing how much money people spend on stuff for their house, for their car, you know, synthetic oil, premium fuel, keeping it super clean, and they're eating Big Macs, sucking down diet sodas, genetically modified E. coli feces, and they don't even do anything to offset the stupidity. It's mind-boggling to me. Well, one of the places that actually has products that work and are effective is getthetea.com. So that's a very easy, shameless plug for me because the stuff works. And what are you going to do? Go out and buy some energy drinks instead? Like I, I was taking this stuff for a while. I haven't taken any for a couple weeks because I just don't even feel like I've needed to now. Is this stuff called colostrum. And that stuff is awesome. Now I may get some more here in a few weeks. And go back on it again for a while. But that stuff definitely helped my food digest better. Gave me all sorts of energy. I mean, I've always been, I've always had a lot of energy, but it even took it to the next level. And uh, people were accusing me of being on Adderall and stuff. <laughs> Which is cool, whatever. I mean, I, I know people that are on Adderall and they've been on them for years and they're very intelligent and stuff. But that's just not for me. I'm organic. I mean, I don't even like to take Tylenol. And I almost cut my toe off once. Literally, I stepped on a, a piece of glass and it cut through the nerves. I had to get it sewed back together. I still can't feel that toe. 
and they gave me like some type of lore tab or something to take after the surgery. And I didn't even like, I mean, if I take a lore tab, I better be in some crazy freaking pain because I feel like I have a mental hangover for the next three days. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that just clouds your mind. It clouds your judgment. And if you can be organic and just, you know, tap into yourself, I feel you don't need that kind of stuff. You know, some people, hey, if that's what you need, that's cool. I'm not judging. For me, it's good to be as organic as possible. And I've also noticed that by cutting down the, the meats, because I've cut down on meats a lot lately as well, I've been feeling better. I've been feeling better about just myself. You know, I, I don't feel guilty when I, if I eat a burger, I feel guilty now. If I eat a piece of chicken, I feel guilty because I know that most likely that chicken or that cow that sacrificed its life for me to eat, you know, it went through hell on earth. It wasn't like it was an organic free range chicken that was just living its life normally. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's, you know, it, no, it was probably living in a factory and it was probably walking around its own feces. It was probably filled with growth hormones its whole life. Probably never even saw sunlight. I heard a story about two chickens, this guy that used to work in a chicken farm. He left it on, on Leak Project, or actually on YouTube.com slash Clyde Vincent Time Lord, said that he used to work as a chicken harvester. And he remembers watching this one time where this chicken was plucking at this other chicken's intestines that was hanging out of its a-hole. I mean, how disgusting is that? I saw this film, this documentary called Food, Inc., where these like psychopaths, these people that were just like borderline serial killers, in my opinion, they were like grabbing chickens and just smashing them just to have fun. The, or they, they were like these little um, these calves that were having a tough time walking. They were sick. So they were just picking them up and slamming them on the ground and laughing about it. And they were getting off on it, literally. It's, it's making me ill thinking about it. Can you imagine being one of those people that was just so sick and so full of hate that you worked at a factory farm and you were like smashing chicken heads in or cow's heads in and you thought it was funny. You're like kicking their head in and something. I mean, it's disgusting. How do people even... It's the year 2017 and people still think like that? I, I just... I'm just shocked. It's disturbing. It's disgusting. And I divagate. So... Anyway, thanks for being here with me. Uh, thanks, mods. I appreciate the, the live audience. You guys are great. Be excellent to each other. Let's, let's leave it with that. Be excellent to each other. Think of ways to be the change, ways to create solutions, not problems. Simple as that. Be the change you want to see.